Good afternoon and welcome to Moments of Hope with yours truly, Pastor Curtis Robert Grant. The Zion Home Family, God bless you. And to all of you that have uh, come to be a part of this presentation, good. God is a wonderful year. And we bless God for another year, uh, 2021. It shall be better than the year we've just come out of. And we are just grateful to God to be in the land of the dying on our way home to the land of the living. God bless you. Uh, to those of you that are going to join with our conference call, you can dial 515-606-5380, and the access code is 636090. And so uh, quickly we have to catch up because we've had our Christmas break and New Year's break and all that kind of stuff, and <clears throat> we want to kind of go back and recap real quick uh, uh, so that we can catch up uh, uh, mentally where we are with the scriptures. Uh, Moses now has gone down into Egypt and he has uh, worked 10 wonderful plagues, uh, miracles in the presence of Egypt, uh, Pharaoh, and all of Israel. And now that God has broken Pharaoh uh, to let the people go, they've come out of Egypt, uh, they have gone across the Red Sea, God performed another miracle for them at the Red Sea when he departed the waters and they walked across on dry land. Then they came to the waters of Mirah, which God turned water, bitter waters into sweet waters. Then they came into the desert where they became hungry. God raised bread from heaven and he gave them specifics uh, about how to approach this, this holy bread. And then after that, God brought them to uh, another place where there was no water and they began to chive uh, against Moses and uh, now God has brought them to the mountain of Hebron where uh, Moses first heard the voice of God and so this is where we are quickly uh, and I want to read um, um, Exodus 19 20 for you uh, real quick but uh, uh, because I want you to see it it says then the Lord came down upon the Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord sent for Moses to come up to the top of the mountain uh, and Moses went up all right and uh, what you see is when we open chapter 20 this is this is where we are uh, it says and God spake all these words saying I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage uh, and he begins to talk to Moses up in the mountain because now you've got to remember what God is about to do here because God has just brought all of Israel out and you've got to understand that Israel has become a pagan nation. Uh, they have become worshipers of other gods and now God brings them out of Egypt and now he begins to set the tone. Uh, for their state of mind, their state of behaviors. And so now he brings them to the mountain because if God does not give them any guidelines, they will continue to operate in the craziness of their bondage, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, paganistic worship. And so God brings them out uh, to, to, to establish for them how to worship a holy God, the only true and living God. And so that's why uh, we are here, because now God is about to bring some stability to the children of Israel. And so he brings Moses up in the mountains, because now he's got to give Moses the, uh, the commands so that Moses can come down and give these commands to the children of Israel. And notice that in verse 3, the first command that he gives is thou shalt have no other gods, little g, before me. All right? And I think that's very powerful and, and important because you've got to understand that the first thing that God uh, regulates is how and when and what they worship. All right? Because when you're coming out of a pagan country where they, work, they have many gods, all right, God is literally trying to eliminate that mindset. He, he says, look, now I know y'all came from a place where y'all got more than one God, but I'm telling you, when it comes to me, you can't have no other gods before me, all right? And so at the end of the day, he establishes uh, himself 
in the mind of Israel. You see, it's one thing to have, to know the law, but it's another thing for it to be established in your life. And so when you look at God, God is now making sure that they are clear about uh, this first command because that's the first thing that God wants to straighten out. Uh, Y'all, excuse me, I dropped my glasses. Uh, that's the first thing that God wants to straighten out uh, when it comes to his children and the people that follow him. Now, let's talk about what that truly means. It says, thou shalt have no other gods, little g, before me. The first thing I think you need to understand is that God is trying to establish and show Israel what love truly looks like, okay? Because I want you to look at it, and I'll show you how I get there. When you look at Mark, okay, uh, Mark uh, chapter 12, verse 30, here is what it says. It says, uh, and I'll go back to 29 for the sake of reading, and Jesus answered him, the first of, uh, the first of all the commands is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first command, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commands greater than these. Now, what am I establishing for you? I'm trying to establish for you that what God is literally doing in uh, the mountain when he gives the first command is he's literally trying to teach Israel how to love him and teaching us how to love one another. Because the premise of this is thou shalt have no other gods. But he's trying to show them what behavior they should have when love is in its proper place. Okay, and that's what we're coming to right now, because if you be honest with yourself, we have lost the real definition of what love is, you know, especially in this generation. When you talk about love, you know, uh, the first thing people think about is sex. If you listen to the, the records, if you listen to the expression, if you listen to people talk, uh, you know, uh, let's make love. If you don't understand what it means, you just keep repeating those phrases in such a way that it's, it, it actually equi is equi uh, equal to sex. But, but the Bible wants to be clear. It says to me uh, that 1 John, I think it's 4 and 8, that God is love. <clears throat> and so when you understand uh, true, uh, 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 the truth, all right, God is love. And so uh, it don't say God uh, has love, God, you know, love us. No, no, it wants to submit that God is the uh, personification of what love is. And so if we don't ever learn how to love from a true place, we got to go back to the original. We got to go back to the source. We got to go back to God himself if we're really going to learn how to love. Because with each inner, inner, uh, generation, uh, Satan has changed the definition, all right? And it's almost like, you know, uh, we, we start off with, with, with the definition meaning that God, it means God, but then now it then, it then diluted itself to the place where, where love means sex, all right? And that's how Satan does. Every generation, he just put a, just another little spin on it so that he can continue to get the definition away from God. All right, so that he can attach another definition to it. And that's what deception is. All right, and that's why you have to read the Bible because in order for you to really understand the truth, all right, you got to go back to the book. You got to go back to the Bible because the devil in his craftiness has defined or redefined a whole lot of words that we express. All right, and we don't even realize it because we have disconnected ourselves from the original. All right, and so you got to see this, and I'm hoping I'm making this clear because when you talk about love in John 4 and 8, if God is love, all right, then you got to understand in order to understand how love operates, how love works, you got to look at God. All right? And so when you go back to the beginning of the Bible, God made us in his image. In other words, he made us in the image of love. We were supposed to be able to express that love because if we look just like God, then love was the order of the day. But when Satan came along and tricked Adam and Eve into God, 
He separated us from God. He separated us from the source of love so that now we begin to operate in our own selfishness. All right. And now we have labeled our selfishness love. All right. Because we no longer know what the true definition is. All right. Now, I want to I have to give you all that history because the power of it is locked up in there. All right. So when you talk about love. All right, you ask people today, what love? What, define love to me. And what they'll do is they'll talk about all of their feelings. I, you know, it, the love is, is to make you feel good. Love, uh, you know, and all of these different uh, adjectives or uh, verbs uh, that would describe love. And y'all, love ain't a verb. Love is a noun. All right? He's a person. All right? He is the very essence of who God is. All right? And while you're talking about how you feel, it ain't got nothing to do with how you feel. All right? Because let's just be honest for two seconds and then I'll move on. Uh, if, if, if God predicated his love on how he feels, then talk, talk to me about this. How does God feel about you or how does God feel about me when we screw up and we know we screwed up? All right? And you don't even feel good about yourself. So you got to know that God don't feel good about you. All right? But the Bible still says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so what that tells me is when I start reading the Bible, that tells me that love is not predicated on one's feeling. Because if God can love me after all of the disappointment I've given to him, then that tells me that love is not an emotion. All right? What it tells me, though, is that love is a commitment. And that's what God is trying to reveal to us right now is that while y'all talking about how you feel, I'm trying to show you that love is a commitment. You see, because your feelings are so fickle, they can be good one day and they can be good at the evening. They are, they are changed to a whole nother, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, premise. But the bottom line is, is that love ain't how you feel. Love is a commitment. You fight, you, you disagree, you do a whole lot of things. But when it's all over and the smoke clears, we still going to be together because we're committed. And see, that's what God is trying <coughs> to help us all understand. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because what I want from you, Israel, is I want your love. <clears throat> and I don't want that stuff that you feel because that's fickle. Because we've been having those problems since we left uh, Egypt. You know, you feel good about me when I bring you across the water then all of a sudden you got a problem with me. Then you feel good about me when I finally provide bread out of the, well, then uh, next the situation you feel bad about me. See, feelings are fickle. But God says what I want from you is your commitment. <clears throat> and says, here's what it really truly means. It means when you're committed to God, there is nothing else more important than he is. And God knows we got to work for that because there's a lot of stuff that we have made more important than God. <clears throat> and you can say what you want with your mouth, but your behavior tells us different. All right. And so when you start really talking about true commitment, and I'm hoping that you hear us in here, uh, if, if, if folks understood what true love is, many people have stood at the altar and said, you know, uh, I, I love you. All right. And, and what does that really mean? I love you until. Yeah, because the moment you run out of money, uh, we're going to talk about divorce, uh, unreconcilable differences. What the hell sandwich is that? Unreconcilable. That's just two stubborn Negroes that don't want to submit. All right. But the truth of it is we give it a name. All right. And we think it's legal. All right. But y'all, let me tell you something. Love says I'm committed to you, even though we don't agree. Hello, somebody. And what I'm saying is, if we operated on that premise, how many divorces would we really hear about? How many divorces would you ever see if we understood that love was a commitment? Because let me tell you something. I can tell you this. I know you got kids. I got kids. Some of us got kids. And if you ain't got kids, thank the Lord for Jesus. But the truth of it is, you love your kids, or you should, all right? And the truth of it is, you have committed yourself under your kids. And how many times have your kid disappointed you? How many times you want to just kick three tails? I ain't want to say that either. How many times you want to just take them and just snap their necks? All right? Because they have 
frustrated you because you have spent hours of time trying to teach them what they should do, how they should do it, because you've been down this road before and you're trying to save them from a lot of stuff they're going to get themselves in. But yet, with their little dumb selves, they go do exactly what you say don't do. And baby, when they do it, it kind of frustrates you. But guess what? Let them go to jail and they pick up the phone and call mama and call daddy. Guess what? Somebody going to come get them because when you know they're your kids, you're committed to them no matter how you feel. I heard somebody on the other end of this camera said, I ain't going to get mine, all right? But you better check your heart, boo-boo, because if you don't, all right, you ain't got to get them, but you better attend to them because sometimes, you know, God will bring them there so that he can teach them a lesson, but you better show up to show him that even though you messed up, I'm still your mom, I'm still your daddy, and you got to show up, all right, to show him that I ain't threw you away. Because I think we threw our, we threw our, we divorced our kids, you know, uh, but let's just be honest, you used to be somebody's kid, all right? They didn't throw you away, and if they did, shame on them, all right? We got to stick with our babies, because if when you throw them away, who do you throw them away to? Because the only connection they got to God is you. And so they got to stick to you so that you can teach them what you already know so that they don't get lost. And the moment you throw them away, guess what? They become the devil's property. And that's what we don't understand, man. You got to be, you know, love is, is hard, but love never throws away. Hello? <laughs> okay. Anyway, and so at the end of the day, I got to, I got to get out of here. Uh, because, you know, when he says, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me, he wants us, what God is literally says is, I want your commitment. Now, the problem is, is that we always talk about how much we love the Lord. And the reason we do that is because that expression of love is an invisible case. I can say how much I love you, and if people don't know what they're looking for, they'll believe it. But love according to this original intent, simply means commitment. And so watch this. If when you tell me you love God and you're not committed to God, then you show me that what's coming out of your mouth does not equal what your behavior becomes. Because commitment to God says no matter what, I am committed to God. That means when it rains on Sunday and your hair get wet, I'm committed to come to church because I got to worship God. See, and we make all kinds of excuses of why we can't be committed. But the truth of it is, is that the more you mature in God and the more you really see that he is your all in all, he is the very source of your life. In him I live and, and, and breathe and have my being. He's the very life force of your life. And when you finally mature to the place where you realize that, you will have a commitment that will be unwavering. All right? And I got to get out of here because my time has gone out. But I'm hoping we'll come back again and talk about this because we got five more uh, uh, commands or at least four more commands to talk about God because the first five is talking about loving God and the second five is talking about how we should love one another as people of God. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. And so I bless God for this privilege to teach the word, and I'm hoping it helped you in some kind of way. Uh, we want you to know that if you want to submit yourself to God today, today is a good day, that you can inbox us your name and phone number, and we can get back with you as soon as possible so that we can try to help you get into a good church. God bless you, and today uh, we are still praying at 1 o'clock. Ain't nothing changing in the, in the year two, two, 2020, 21, all right, because we still need to pray. Prayer is something we have to all, the man shall always pray the Bible says, all right? And I know that the old African proverb is, you know, a family that prays together stays together, and we need to certainly stay together uh, throughout this journey. God bless you and keep you is our prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have done uh, in year 2020. We are now looking forward to two, uh, 2021. We expect a greater year. Uh, we thank you for all you have brought us through, and we are awfully grateful for all of the things that you have hidden from our faces, the, the, the things that the devil wanted to do, you didn't allow them to do. And God, we just say thank you. But now, God, we are moving into a new year, and we are brushing off the old, and we have our future in front of us, and we're looking for bigger and greater things in this year. 
God, I pray that we don't bring the sadness of 2020 into the year of 2021 because we are about to bring our past into our future. We want to leave our past into our past and look forward to the future which you have developed for us and we want to enjoy every moment of it. Cover us with your blood and we'll be careful to give you praise going on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.